But I'd like to start by introducing you to my sister, my niece, Isla. So a few years ago, my sister became a mum for the first time. And about a year after Isla had been born, we were chatting about what it was like to be a mum. So we were chatting about what it was like to be a mum. And my sister said it was the best thing that's ever happened to her. It was absolutely amazing. She literally couldn't love Isla anymore. But as we continued talking, there's one thing that she mentioned that actually had been getting to her a little bit ever since Isla had been born. And this was the fact that no matter how hard she tried, no matter how much she did for Isla, no matter how much she sacrificed, there was always a little something extra that she could have done. So ever since my niece Isla was born, ever since my sister had become a mum, she'd been carrying around this feeling of guilt with her. And this feeling is so common, it's actually been dubbed in the media as parent guilt. So I don't have parent guilt myself, I don't have kids, but I can certainly sympathise with my friends and family that do. But it got me thinking, when, when I was listening to my sister, I thought, hmm, this sounds very familiar. And this feeling of guilt that she was describing was very similar to the same feeling of guilt that I had as a teacher since I started teaching. Because no matter how much I prepared for the lessons, there was always a little bit extra that I could have done. And I think it's very common as a teacher to suffer from feelings of guilt. So I thought I'd start this session with a session of teacher confessions. So things that you do as a teacher or moments in your teaching career that make you feel guilty. Here are some of mine. So I'd like you just for 30 seconds or so, turn to somebody sitting close to you and let's confess what makes you feel guilty as a teacher. This is actually a good thing. The fact that you walk around feeling guilty all day is a good thing. Because I think we've all had those teachers, possibly at school, the ones that didn't care about their jobs at all. And I bet they didn't go around feeling guilty about whether they were serving the students enough. So the very fact that you are feeling guilty, is it means that you care about your jobs, and more importantly, you care about your students as well, which almost by default makes you a really good teacher. But the problem with guilt is that it's not always logical. So I remember very early on in my teaching career, in the first year or so, I had a group of five-year-olds, Italians, who were learning English. And it was Easter, so we wanted to make happy Easter cards. And because they were only five, they were struggling, they, well, they were still learning to, to write in their native language. So I decided to do these join the dot letters where students could join them together and write happy Easter. So there I was, hand doing all of the dots on the cards. <laughs> Luckily, there were only six students and not 30. And at a certain point, one of my workmates came over and she looked over and she said, can't you just photocopy that? <laughs> and of course, that, that was really stupid on my part. I could have just done one and then photocopied the others. So I went over to the photocopier and I started photocopying them. And then I got this really weird feeling of guilt. And I thought, because I wasn't spending as much time preparing the lesson as I'd originally planned to. But at the same time, I was really aware of how ridiculous that feeling was because it didn't change the students' experience whatsoever. Whether they got a photocopied card or a hand-drawn one wouldn't make any difference to the learning. And after this experience, I started asking myself this question more and more. So does the amount of preparation and the amount that we sacrifice ourselves, does that have a direct consequence on the learning. And I started to notice that often there was no correlation. So sometimes I'd spend ages making these little card games, choosing the cards, printing them off, cutting them up, and the game would be over in two minutes. Or even worse, it lasted for longer, but the students weren't really that into it. And every now and then I'd have lessons where I had hardly any time to prepare at all, I'd just run in at the last minute with the book and then maybe improvise a little task where they were moving around a little bit more and things went really well and the students really enjoyed it. And I see this all the time in the staff room as well. So I think many of us spend far too long possibly choosing the right picture for the lead-in 
that is over very quickly or may not make that much difference to students. Um, and this morning in Pierre's talk, we were talking about this experience that I think many of us have had, where in the first two minutes you walk into a classroom and you're just chatting and everybody's really, really interested and then suddenly you start doing what you'd prepared and the class just goes really flat. <laughs> So often there isn't a link, but to talk about this in more detail, we have to talk about student experience. So what makes for a good student experience? And I've been doing some review mining, so looking at reviews of language schools. And here are some things that the students said that they didn't like. So things like, I think the first one is interesting, uh, a student having the book but complaining that the teacher didn't use it. Because I think often as teachers we feel pressure not to use the book, uh, but students actually really want it when they have it, at least to some extent. But then we have the other extreme as well, so a student complaining that the teacher just went through the book question after question. Then another student feeling like the lesson wasn't personal to them enough. Then we've got things that students seem to really like, a recurring theme of students liking teachers that are uh, teachers and lessons that are creative and fun. So things that I didn't find <laughs> in my review mining, and things that I've never heard a student say in my 10 years of teaching. And I think this is interesting because these are things that we often tend to spend a lot of time worrying about, or at least I know I do. But overall, from, from interacting with students over the years and from my review mining, it seems that students generally tend to be happy when these things are in place. So when students have the lessons are fun and personal, the use of the book is balanced, the teacher is passionate and creative, and most importantly, the last one, because that's what students come to us for, right? To learn a lot. And as I've been thinking about these things, I've started to realise that actually it's possible to tick all of these boxes without spending very much time planning your lessons at all. So I've developed a new planning philosophy where before I sit down and start to plan my lessons, I almost make a promise to myself, so I decide I'm going to try and choose as many activities as possible that are here. So these are activities that students really love and they find useful and they help them learn, but that don't require a lot of preparation on my part. I really, really don't want to be here, completely avoid activities like this, so activities that take a lot of my time and that students don't find that useful. But at the same time, I don't really want to be here either, because even though these are things that students enjoy and find useful, um, they take up a lot of my time and energy in, in the preparation stages. And the reason that I don't really want to be here is because there are so many options here that I found that it's not really necessary anymore to spend so much time planning. And so how can we do this? How can we cut down on our planning time without feeling guilty? Um, the first are activities that are think and go activities. So those kind of activities that you can just think of, you have the activity in your head already, maybe you can write down a word or two in your lesson plan and you can just go in and do it. The second, speedy supplementing, so fast ways to supplement the textbook. And the last one, templating. So th templates that you can just pick up and apply to many different types of lessons. So the first one is, we're going to talk about flashcards. This is one thing that often takes a lot of time preparing. But instead of spending all of that time printing and cutting, there are many other ways that you can do lead-ins with flashcards. So apologies, I'm going to have to put the mic down for this. Here's one of them. So sorry if you can't see very well at the back, but people at the front, you can help. What's this? Rabbit. 
rabbits. Yeah, perfect. And the worse you are at drawing, the better it is, because it takes students a little bit longer to guess. So it gives a little bit of mystery. And there are so many other alternatives that you can do that have a similar effect. So as well as drawing the flashcards yourself, you can um, get students to draw them. So why not get the students to close their eyes? Imagine that they're in a supermarket, for, imagine, uh, for example, if you're going to do food. Imagine they're in a supermarket. And then when they open their eyes, they can draw what they saw. Alternatively, a race. This doesn't require any preparation time. Um, in teams, give students the lesson theme, and they spend a couple of minutes trying to write as many related words as possible. Or what about miming? So uh, this depends on the theme. You can't do it with all of them. But um, what food am I, for example? Banana. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, what job is this? Hairdresser. Yeah, hairdresser. And another thing that I think we tend to forget as teachers is that in the textbooks as well, we already have hundreds of very nice images that you can use. And they may not necessarily, they don't have to be related to the lesson. Uh, or they, they don't have to be used in the same way that they were intended to to be used in the textbook. You can use them for whatever you want. So for example, things like getting a student to choose a picture um, and then describing it to their partners and the partner has to find it in the book. And the interesting thing about these kind of activities that we'll see as we go on and we look at other activities as well, is that often when you do less preparation beforehand, the student has to pick up the slack in the class. So the student ends up doing more and interacting with the materials and the lesson theme more. And eventually that means that they're also learning more as well because they're more engaged. Another thing is worksheets. This is one thing that can take up a huge amount of time when it comes to planning lessons. Um, I'd say the first thing is to ask yourself, do you really need a worksheet? because often there are many other ways to practice the same language point that gets students moving up uh, and walking around and interacting with each other more. But if, if you really do need to use a worksheet or you really want to use one, there are a couple of ways that you can actually prepare the worksheet with the students in class rather than doing it beforehand. So, for example, you could do it as a dictation or you could sketch out the worksheet on the board together so if you're doing find someone who, for example, and you have an idea in your head of what you want the worksheet to look like, you can draw it on the board, students copy you, and then you can even get students to suggest and elicit from students ideas of wh which activities to put in the find someone who section. Another great one is games. So having these games in your head that, again, you can just think of, and go straight into the classroom and do them. So we've got the classics, of course, things like Pictionary, Miming, Back to the Board. I'm sure when it comes to this, you guys probably already have quite a lot that you use and do in your class already. So I thought it would be a good chance just in 30 seconds or so, turn to someone sitting close to you and share. Do you have any of these games that you use in your classes that you can just go in and do? Speak to the person sitting next to you not just for speaking, you could also do this for listening activities, for example. Um, so students can listen, and between each listen, they find a new partner to talk about what they understood. So this way, uh, students are helping each other to build up the knowledge and understand what they just heard. So let's talk about card games quickly. I think card games are an interesting one because they are great in class. Students do really like card games. There's no getting around that. But when it comes to preparation, making cards can take a really long time because you have to choose them and cut them up and everything. So, uh, but one great way around this is to make the cards with the students in class. So for example, all you need 
are some blank cards like these. Carry them around with you. And then let's say, for example, you want to do a lesson on the present perfect. You could start by talking about interesting life experiences, maybe things you've done, things you've never done, uh, and start by writing some cards together as a class. What makes an interesting life experience? Something like go to Australia, cook paella, eat sushi, etc. And then you can get students, once they've got the idea, students can start writing life experiences on the cards as well. And after a few minutes, you've already got all of the cards you need. Um, for, for example, for a, a game with the present perfect where you put, a card in, you put cards in the middle of the table, students take the top card, they look at the life experience, and then they talk together in their groups about whether they've done that thing or not. And I'm sure, as um, teachers, I'm sure you can think of loads of different games that you could play with these kind of cards to practice the present perfect, for example. Another very simple way to supplement the book is with a simple piece of A3 paper, or pieces of A3 paper. So there are many things you can do with these. Uh, one, sticking them around the classroom. You could use these for, uh, for students to take notes before a speaking task. So you could have maybe the different topics the students go around and take notes and reply to each other's notes to uh, prepare before a speaking activity. You could also do this for listening, so students walk around and write what they heard, what they understood, and then they walk around and read the other notes and they can add to them. Or you could get students to have, um, sitting down, one student is in charge of the A3 piece of paper for each group, and then as they take notes in the group, periodically the students can swap groups and bring their paper with them. But I'm sure you guys can think of many other nice things to do and nice ways to supplement the textbook with these materials, so with the cards and the paper. So let's do this for a moment. This is a, uh, a reading task uh, about the... It's in a chapter to practice the present perfect. And it's a blog post um, by Julia, and she's talking about bucket lists. So she's talking about the fact that she used to have this crazy bucket list with um, things like swim with dolphins, climb Mount Everest, uh, but she hasn't done any of these things. And then at the end she talks about how now she has done more, she's written a new realistic bucket list. And here at the top you've got things like plant a tree, do a charity walk, write a poem. And then here at the bottom you've got some comments. So with the people sitting close to you, think about this for a moment. How could you supplement a lesson like this using just some A3 paper or those? Let's talk now about templating. So having something that you can adapt to many different topics and many different classes. So if you, um, not everybody does this, but some, uh, for teachers who work in schools with interactive whiteboards and who use PowerPoint presentations in class, this can be another thing that takes up a lot of prep time. One way to reduce this is to have template, templates, slides which are like templates that you can use in every class and you can complete together as a class. So this is, for example, one that I have which is just called class examples and then I'll adapt it to, to the grammar or the vocabulary point that students are practicing. And we do this after the free practice. So talk to me. Um, when did people use narrative tenses? Give me some examples, and then we'll complete it as a class together. Another great one for templating is presentations. So presentations are a great low prep activity that gets students really working hard and thinking and practicing the language. And, but often it's nice to have a structure to follow. So this is a template where we have um, first of all, students choose a topic in groups. Then the next stage, the planning stage, students write some rhetorical questions about the topic um, and then they take notes on them. So they, they think about how they might like to answer the questions. Then the next stage, they give the presentation and the other students watch and, ta and take notes and listen carefully so that they can answer questions. 
And then in la the last part, there's a reflection stage where students think about the, the presentations they saw and discuss about whether there was anything that surprised them or anything new that they learnt. And this is a template, this is something that you could just pick up and use for any topic whatsoever. Okay, so I'm going to end this by giving you a permission slip. You have my full permission to start thinking about how you can reduce your planning time and try as much as possible um, to really um, to start reducing your planning time without feeling guilty. How can you do it without feeling guilty? Well, as long as you are also thinking about activities which enhance student learning as much as possible, there's absolutely no reason to feel guilty.